once it is complete or review it if you'd like. Um, and then we will have a question and answer period um, at the end. All right, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lisa. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Yolanda. As she said, my name is Lisa McDonald, and I am the science writer here at the American Ceramic Society. And I specialize in finding ways to communicate science to non-specialist audiences. And non-specialist audience can mean anyone who is not familiar with the particular science that you are discussing. So it could be other researchers whose specialties are in other fields, or it could be to the general public or people who do not have advanced degrees or a very strong science background. So in today's presentation, I'm going to be focusing on four key elements of good visual design of science communication. But before we get into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about why communicating your research is so important. And there's three big reasons I'm going to discuss about why the communication is important. The first is that it helps other researchers. Science experimentation is a lot like a maze. When you first start out, you're not sure which way it's going to prove most beneficial when you are doing experiments in the lab or your theoretical calculations. And many times you run into dead ends in the research where pathways you experimented on do not prove that fruitful. Many times the results of these dead end experiments are stuffed away in the back of the cabinet drawer and not communicated to anyone. But by doing this, it can end up that lots of different researchers and different groups across the country and across the globe follow along these unfruitful paths as well, with no one reporting to the other groups about the dead end measures that were being conducted. However, if you publicize or talk about your research, even the parts that did not work out too well, you can do this either through publishing your research or giving oral or poster presentations in scientific conferences. It helps advance the scientific enterprise at a much quicker rate since people know which channels are not very fruitful to pursue. And it helps limit the waste of resources, be that time or money, that are funneled into finding the most beneficial routes of scientific research. Another reason why it's so important to communicate your research is because it helps the general public. Back in the mid 18 to late 1800s, it used to be that scientific researchers talked to the general public a lot. As you can see in this image, Michael Faraday is giving a lecture to children at a Christmas lecture in 1856. However, at the turn of the century, and with the rise of the publishing paradigm of journals to communicate research and with the world wars, there became a large schism between scientists and the general public scientists were not talking to or communicating the science directly to the general public. It wasn't until about 30 years ago, especially with the notable Cosmos series by Carl Sagan in 1980, that scientists began communicating with the general public regularly again. One reason, and communicating with the general public is very important in this information age. You may have heard about a lack of scientific literacy in the general public, but what this refers to is not merely the knowledge or raw memorization of scientific facts. Many people can list off plenty of scientific facts to you. What is missing is the, the better understanding and the communication of how individual science facts or experiments relate to other experiments in that field and also relate to the larger society how the science that is being conducted affects them personally or society at large. By communicating your research to the general public, you are helping them to build a much better appreciation for the research that you are doing, which can build public support. And public support is a large factor behind what research fields end up getting funded by governments and private organizations. And it also helps make society as a whole, a more liter literate, politically engaged body who can understand what science is taking place and why, and people can then use that to help decide who they wish to vote for to be their congresspeople. And then, of course, finally, it's important to communicate your research because it helps you. 
As many of our participants probably are, they are in their undergraduate or graduate stages. And if they haven't yet, they will soon be writing grants or helping the principal investigator write grants to fund the research that they are conducting. And if you are able to, the people that you are writing to, the funding agencies for many of these grants, may be scientists themselves, but they most certainly will not be specializing in the specific field of the ex specific experiment that you're trying to get funding for. And so if you are able to communicate clearly in your grant writing why your research is different from other paths that have been taken before and why it can move the field forward as a whole, which you can get from communicating with other researchers about the dead ends at conferences, as I discussed. And also, if you know how to place that field into a more uh, socially connected context, like you get when you practice communicating your research to the general public, then you are able to write much stronger grant proposals that will lead to getting your research funded. Now that we know some of the reasons why it is important to communicate your research, we're going to go into the specifics of how to communicate your research well. When it comes to communicating research, there are different ways in which it can be communicated. And the one we are talking about today is poster presentations. Now, poster presentations are a different way of communicating your research than another prominent way, which is the journal articles. Journal articles are communicating your research to other researchers who are probably specializing in your field. And the point of journal articles is to include as much information as you can so someone reading it can verify the, the validity of your, of your experiments and the strength of the scientific process you conducted and also redo the experiment if they wish to verify its findings. However, when it comes to poster presentations, they are meant as a visual aid to you, the presenter. Posters are not meant to be self-standing objects like journal articles are. And that key difference is going to influence the visual elements that we use to create a poster. Because posters are supposed to help you as the presenter shine, to let yourself really come forward and demonstrate what your knowledge of the research is. So to create a good poster, we're going to use four elements of visual design. Contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. With these four elements, which can be applied not just to posters, but to infographics or PowerPoint presentations, other visual forms of communication. We are able to turn a poster that looks like this, which is based on some research I conducted during my undergraduate studies, into a poster that looks like this. To begin with, we're going to talk about contrast, the first element of visual design. Contrast is a difference in shape, color, size, and or texture. And what contrast allows you to do is help pull out certain visual elements of your poster to draw people's eye to them. When you have low contrast, there isn't much of a difference between any of those four elements, shape, or color, or size, or texture. But when you have high contrast, there is a very marked difference between the shapes, color, sizes, and textures, as you can see on the right hand visualization. It is important to note, though, that too much contrast is distracting. In this beginning poster, before we have applied any of the visual elements designed to it, you can see that we have a difference in size between the, the heading size and the body text size. We have a difference in texture where we have the crosshatch pattern on the background versus the smooth pattern on the, the, inner, the inner text boxes. We have a contrast in color. There are tons of colors going on. We've got peaches, we've got blues, we've got crimsons, we've got yellows. And then we also have a difference in shape where most of this stuff is blocky, boxy, rectangles, but we also have some ovals going on. So when it comes to contrast, you want to select maybe two of the four elements to contrast while holding the other two steady. Because if everything is being contrasted at once, your eyes are not going to be immediately drawn to any one thing, which is key to telling a visual story with your science. 
For myself, I'm going to choose size and color as my two things to contrast, which means I need to remove the contrast that are going on in shape and texture. So going back to my poster, the first thing we're going to do is get all of the shapes to match each other. So that right hand oval is going to become a right hand rectangle. Now, everything is some form of square or rectangle, very blocky. The next thing we're going to do is remove the crosshatch texture in the background, and we're going to make it smooth. And the reason I made the background smooth instead of making all of the boxes crosshatch is because when you are designing a visual background, the important information is the text and the graph, not what's going on in the background. You want the background to be as bland as possible or very smooth, not to have distracting images or make the whole image the background, because that'll make it difficult to read the text and see the information of the science that you wish to highlight. So when it comes to the two elements I am contrasting, the size and the color, the size we're going to contrast the heading and the body text. Usually you want at least a 15 point font difference between the heading and the body text so that it's clearly able to distinguish the two when walking by a poster. In my case, I use 55 font heading for the heading and 40 font for the body text. And usually you do not want to go below 36 font for the body text on a big poster at a poster presentation. When it comes to color, the two I'm choosing are crimson and gold for my schemes because those are the colors of my undergraduate university. And with the crimson and gold, we're going to match a white color text to the crimson and a black color text to the gold so that the colors of the words in the background are contrasted against each other and you can clearly read them from a distance. On top of that, I'm going to have two variations of my crimson for the results section to help pull out the different parts of my results so that they pop out to three of their own little sections. When it comes to color, there are two big things to keep in mind. The first is that your color scheme is complementary. When you might have two colors that are very different from each other and are very loud, like neon green or fluorescent pink, but for the eyes, those two are very too contrasting from each other. For the contrast of the colors, you want them different from but complementary to each other, not different from and contrasting, because that can be distracting. When you select things within PowerPoint, if you're using that program to create your poster, it comes with a built-in color scheme that can show you some colors that are complementary. After this presentation, I'm going to be having a Word document emailed to all of you participants that gives some free resources online listing uh, color, color scheme tools online that can help you if you're not using PowerPoint or if you wish for something different. One of the ones I find very useful is the Adobe Color Wheel that can show you many different ways to complement your colors. The other thing to keep in mind with colors is creating graphs for color blindness. So what I'm demonstrating here is I pick the color scheme crimson and gold. But when it's viewed with someone who, with NMLS trichromatic uh, color blindness, that means one of the cones is not working quite, quite correctly, one of the color cones in their eyes. In this case, I chose the green cone is not working the best, and you can see it makes the crimson look more brown than golden. Dichromatic color blindness is when one of the cones does not function at all whatsoever. In this case, the green one again, and you can see it looks like a muddy brown versus the gold. In my case, even though you cannot tell it's a red crimson color, there is still a marked difference between the two colors I chose. So someone who is viewing a graph that maybe had these colors would be able to tell the difference. Now, when it comes to the color blindness, you want to specifically think about it when it comes to graphs because there's usually a lot of colors going on, especially if you have like bar graphs or line graphs where there's lots of intersecting colors and layers going on at the same time. And in the case of like bar graphs, you could also make your different bars have different textures, give another layer of difference between them rather than just the colors. 
And in the resource that will be shared after this presentation, there are some tips for how you can design your, your graphs so that they are understandable and readable by people who are viewing it with color blindness. So now that we have discussed the two things I will contrast in my poster, we're going to implement those changes. So the first thing we're going to do is make that left hand column the same goal that's on the right. And then we're going to make the blue in the result section, we're going to change that to the variations of the crimson that I discussed before. The last thing we need to do is we need to standardize and contrast the heading to the body text. Right now, as you can see, a lot of the headings are not that, that black color that we chose to put with the gold. They are a bunch of different colors, which is a bit distracting and not easily understandable. And so now we switch them all to the black so you can easily see where each of the headings are followed by each of the body text. As the contrast, comes repetition, the second part of visual design. Repetition is when you have repeated shapes, colors, sizes, and textures. And repetition is basically the sibling into contrast. The things that you choose to contrast are usually the things you end up repeating as well. In my case, the, the size contrast, we repeat throughout the post the, the, the heading versus the body text, the heading's bigger than the body text, and we repeat that in each section. In addition to the size, the other thing I'm going to choose to repeat is going to be the shape. And when I'm talking about shape, I'm talking about the shape of the body text, which I'm going to turn into bullet points. The reason for turning something into bullet points is it does, one, it offsets it more from the heading to make it even more obvious. But more importantly, as I said before, poster presentations are meant to be an aid to the presenter and not self-standing objects. Many people tend to write full body paragraphs which they put onto their posters. And when you write that, it can become crowded with lots of text, lots of graphs, and someone walking by could be very intimidated looking at that much massive information. When at poster presentations, there are dozens of other posters to go by and they want to be able to absorb the information fairly quickly. However, even if someone decides to stop and read the whole paragraph, it can leave the presenter feeling a bit awkward because there's nothing they can elaborate on when everything is written on the poster. And so if you take the paragraphs and change them into bullet points that only highlight the, the general details of your research, someone who wants the general details can quickly pick that up. But for people who want to go more in depth, you as the presenter at that point can step in and really demonstrate your knowledge and if their judges impress them with your grasp of the research that you are conducting. And when we take this on the full, uh, the full size poster, we're going to make, change it from the body text to the bullet points. You can see that frees up a lot of room. The one place you'll notice I didn't change it in the bullet points is the introduction. And the introduction is a bit different from the other sections because it's introducing or the welcome to the poster when people walk up to it. And so it can be a bit more fully fleshed to give people a nice welcome, a nice introduction into what we'll be following. But now with the shorter, now with the shorter body text areas with the, the bullet points, we can see that there's some awkward spacing which leads us to the next part of visual element design, which is alignment. Alignment is the way every element is placed in a design. And in the case of our poster, we've got some weird alignments going on, especially in the results section. Up at the top, we have an uh, upside down L shape, where we've got one graph off to the right, one down to the bottom, and neither seems to directly engage with or refer back to the body paragraph that's talking about that section. And at the bottom, that one's just crammed full of a lot of different, a lot of different graphs that in some ways are a bit redundant and over, overwhelm the text. There's not a good balance between text and graphs in that. Uh, section. And so when it comes to fixing the alignment so that each graph clearly refers to each body text, we can do that by limiting the number of graphs. 
And the way you limit the number of graphs is by determining what pieces of information are actually relevant to move the main storyline forward. And that should be about three to five graphs when you're finished. So the first thing we're going to notice on mine is I've got a random theory down in the bottom right hand corner. This theory, of course, was useful for understanding the research when I was doing the experiments, but it doesn't tell us anything about the results of the main findings of this research. And for someone who wants to come by at a poster presentation and learn that, this isn't going to do anything for them. So we can move it. Then when it comes to this section, where I have a ton of graphs, when I evaluate the information that it's discussing, I will see that I was comparing FTIR readings between annealed glass samples and quenched glass samples. And while this was helpful to leading me toward my final conclusions of the conductivity and structure of my glasses when they were annealed, this background information is not necessary to understand the final conclusions. So I, for the most part, can remove all of the graphs in that section. Up at the top, as I mentioned before, we've got one off to the right, one to the bottom. And on inspection, we can realize that the information that's circled can be, can be seen at, in the bottom graph, which can be, when if someone is curious about that, the presenter can then call it out and demonstrate their knowledge. The final one I'm going to call out is over here, this random conductivity graph. It can look kind of pretty, doesn't really add anything at all. And the other graph picture that is next to it of my glass getting conductivity measurements done on it in the furnace is actually much more visually attractive. And so we're gonna to to blow that up and give it a bit more room on its own. So after identifying all of these different graphs that we can remove, our poster ends up looking like this. And I do want to point out this picture in particular that I mentioned. When you're creating visually appealing information or posters, be it the infographics, the PowerPoint, you want to try to have at least one image that is very visually pleasing, even if it doesn't communicate specific information like the graphs do. A poster that only has graphs and tables can look very clinical, not very user friendly. And so if you can find an image that shows what your research is about, even if it's not directly from your research, for example, if you are creating ceramic water filters and it's about cleaning water, if you have an image of someone drinking clean water, that can demonstrate the general purpose of your research. It's very visually pleasing. But finding those images can be sometimes difficult for, for people. Where can I find copyright-free images? In the, in the Word document that will be sent out later after this presentation, there is a list of some places where you can get free copyright visually pleasing scientific images. And I'm going to point out two of them now. The first one is Flickr, which has free image resources. It's a social media sharing website that was really popular in around 2008. And even though it might not actively be being updated as much as it was, it's more acts as an archival storage where a ton of people have uploaded their scientific images and clearly labeled what the copyright usages of these images are. When you go in and search Flickr, there's a button that you can create for the licenses. And if you set it to all Creative Commons, it will only show you the images that have copyright licenses. That means you could probably use them on your poster. Another great place to look for scientific images if you need some visually pleasing ones are on the government science websites like NASA, DOAE, EPA, and NOAA. A lot of them have photo libraries on their website and by and large images that are placed on government websites like this in their photo libraries are in the public domain. You are able to use them. However, there are times when these Websites will feature images from outside collaborators, which are thus not in the public domain. And if you come across an image on the photo libraries of the government sources that you are not positive on what their copyright license is, many of these places also have Flickr pages, the social media site I referred to earlier. And if you go to the government's Flickr page, then you can clearly see what the copyright licenses are. Now that we went through 
the alignment, we're down to proximity, which is our last part of visual design. And proximity is the grouping objects and placing them near or far from each other. And proximity is to alignment what repetition was contrast. Before I deleted all of those graphs and removed them to make the alignment a bit smoother, the proximity, especially in the bottom part of that result section, was very crowded together. And there wasn't much room between the text and the images. When it comes to creating a visually pleasing poster that people want to engage with, you want to leave some blank space between the sections, between the graphs, so that it doesn't seem like a wave of text and images coming at them. And so when you're going through your poster and you purposefully design it to leave some blank space and you maybe show it to your professor or principal investigator and they recommend more things to put in there, feel free to talk about why blank space is important because the less information on the poster, the more you get to present as a presenter and demonstrate your knowledge and your strengths. However, there is also the flip side where you have too much proximity, there's too much space. And we ran into that once I removed most of my graphs. So to fix that, I'm going to move the references and the acknowledgement section over into the right-hand column and then recenter everything on the page. And when we do that, this is the result. Now there's only one part left on the poster where we still have some extra blank space. And the best way to fill this in is with a little bit of information that many people don't often include on their posters, which is contact information. When you are presenting at a, at a poster presentation, not only is it an opportunity to shop in your presenting skills or to demonstrate your research, it can also be a huge opportunity to network and get yourself internships or jobs or funding by people who stop by and talk to you and discuss about your research in your poster. And if you have business cards that you can hand to people who may wish to follow up with you later, that's wonderful. But there are also times when you might step away from the poster and it needs to be able to communicate that information on its own. So if you include a place that has your contact information, you're increasing your chances of someone who is interested in your research being able to follow up with you later and provide those internships or those funding opportunities. So using the four elements of visual design, the contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity, we were able to take the poster that looks on the left-hand side and turn it into the poster on the right. At this point, that concludes the presentation, and I'm free to answer any questions or comments that you may have. Thank you, Lisa. So if you do have any questions, there is a way that you can raise your hand um, within the um, attendees uh, just right next to your name, or you may choose to use the chat box, and we will go ahead and answer those questions now. So it looks like we have Dominic. I am going to unmute you, Dominic, in one moment. Apologies, Dominic, it looks like it's, we're having trouble unmuting you. So um, if you are able to use the chat box, we can perhaps answer your question there. Hi, ah, yes, Dominic, thank you. Dominic, if you want to go ahead and include your question, we will see if we can get an answer for you. Uh, Dominic states he's coming in from the University of Alabama at Birmingham.
uh, as a PhD student in materials engineering. That's all right, Dominic. Uh, did you have a question for us? Okay, so Dominic states that he has a poster presentation in a couple of months and he wanted to ask if this webinar is going to be made available to everyone later and yes it is. So we are recording this webinar currently um, and it will be available on the ceramics.org website. And are there any additional questions? Um, the website is ceramics.org. Hi, Zuhair. Um, you're coming in from the Qadi Ayad University in Morocco, um, and he asks if there is any specifications in poster sizes. That's a good question. And with my poster, mine ended up being 48 inches by 48 inches. I went for a big square poster. But usually, if you think of posters, you want to keep it um, within three feet by four feet, which would be one meter to like 1.33 meters. If you have it at least that size, but probably no more than four feet by four feet of the 1.3 meter by 1.3 meter, play within those dimensions. Those are the standard sizes that you will find on poster printing websites if you do not have a poster printer printer available at your university. And those are the sizes that will usually fit within the given space for your presentation while also being big enough to be viewed by people walking by. All right, do we have any additional questions? It looks like we have a question from Francisco. And it'll be just one moment here. Um, he asks um, about the Flickr, use of the Flickr oh, yeah. images. So with the Flickr images, when they cannot be used by any user. That's why, if I come back to this page to show, you can see what kind of license was given to the Flickr image when it was uploaded. The ones that have all Creative Commons types of licenses are the images that you're able to use on Flickr. And Creative Commons can come in different kinds. There are the images that are marked like CC by um, essay, which are share alike, where if you take the image, you can manipulate it, and then if you, sh you share it, you have to share it under the same license. Then there are also non-commercial licenses where commercial entities like businesses cannot use it to sell products, but nonprofits like myself or you as a student for a poster presentation could use them. And so there is also a website that gives backgrounds on all Creative Commons licenses if you just type in uh, copyright licenses into Google, or if you go to Flickr and click on one of the licenses on the image, it'll take you to that website that shows you all the different kinds of licenses. But you do need to make sure that they're labeled all Creative Commons because that will put you in the right ballpark of images on Flickr you can use. So he also asks um, that about um, he uploaded some photos to Flickr and yep that doesn't automatically uh, make them accessible to anyone to use. The automatic upload with Flickr is usually the default all copyrights to the owner okay. so that no one can use them except the owner. That's usually the default when you upload to Flickr. You have to go in and change the copyright to make it available to people if you so wish. All right, hopefully that answered your question. Um, so the reference that you would use is you would give the name of the uploader and then you would say Flickr to identify what site it came from. And then in parentheses after Flickr, you would write the specific license that it was published under, which you will see listed on the photograph page. All right, and then we have our next question from Hum. Um, he is wondering if any of the principles need to be adjusted when making PowerPoint slides, and if you have any strategies to connect with info on previous slides. Not sure. 
connect with info on previous slides. Um, well, when it comes to connecting with info on previous slides, PowerPoint is a pretty straightforward application. Um, it, there are ways to jump between different slides, but depending on if you create your PowerPoint on the Windows and then move it to a Mac, those transitions or those fun animations may not transfer correctly. So it's usually best, as I did in my case, you can see instead of animating my different parts to come up, I've created them each as separate slides. So that way when I move my presentation from a Windows to a Mac, the animations quote unquote would appear to, to be happening without any actual internal animations going on. If you want to be able to connect a lot to previous slides and move around a lot, Prezi is a really good way for communicating information as well that has a lot more freedom in the ways in which you move through the presentation than the PowerPoint, which is a pretty linear uh, visual format. Mm -hmm. All right, and then we have a oh, with the principles that need to be adjusted. Most of these uh, principles are pretty much the same, but since one thing that can be different is if you're doing a presentation that maybe is giving uh, very different parts, you can have a bit more fun with the, the colors and the shapes and the sizes because on the, the, on the poster, which is just a static piece of information, you want to make sure like all the title headings are the same colors and things. So you can, when you take in all the information at once, you can see those similarities. But if you're giving a PowerPoint presentation, you could specialize like the colors and textures and the contrast to each of the different sections of the slides, since it would be very obvious as you move through it what section you are in at that point, since it's being viewed um, in real time versus as a one static object. All right, hopefully that answered your question. Um, we have a question from Eric uh, from Ontario Tech. Um, he states, removing many of the diagrams frees up space, but at the same time may remove precious information. Is this supposed to be compensated by you explaining the diagrams verbally? Also, what about people that just look? And you are right that when you remove the diagram to free up space, what it is removing, you as the presenter are then to step in and explain what those diagrams were verbally. Uh, uh, Poster um, presentations, are meant to communicate the general ideas, not the specifics. They're not supposed to contain all the information that you would have in a journal article. The best way I see when it comes to presenting posters is to think about it like an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch is the idea that you get into the elevator with someone who can provide you an internship or funding, and you have three minutes until you get to the floor they get off on to deliver every, all the important things they need to know. If you practice giving an elevator pitch of your information and can only cover the general most important parts, that's the stuff that you should be putting on the poster. We, as scientists, we always love all of our details and all the specifics, and I understand that too since I have a background in physics. But when communicating to people who are not specializing in your specific field, they want to know more of the generals. What might feel like precious information to us isn't necessarily the information that they need to get the, the main ideas. And so that's how we compensate is when we remove some of that, you as the presenter, if they do wish for more information, can step in and give it. All right, and then we have a question from Ikut. Um, he asks, what kind of font should be used in the poster? So most standard fonts that you'd wanna use are like the Arials, the Times New Roman, the Calibri. Some people are against Times New Roman with the sans, uh, the serifs, where you have like the extra like little uh, slips on like the ends of the letters, like the S's and stuff. Some prefer aerials where everything is very, very straight. But if you use one of those standard fonts, you can be pretty sure it's going to be printed correctly or transferred to different uh, computers or running databases correctly. And so Times New Roman, Calibri, Arial, those are usually the general ones that you want to use. All right. Um, do we have any additional questions? Um, we do have a question from Ali. Um, 
he asks or she asks, do you advise against having the objectives and conclusion keywords as bolder or in different colors? That's actually a really great idea. Is one thing I didn't use on my own poster, but some people can, is you can have accent colors. In my case, I had the basic black text on gold and white text on crimson. But if there is a specific piece of information, like a statistic that you really want to pop out, you can choose one accent color that complements the, the main colors that you can use sparsingly uh, throughout your post to really pull that one piece out. And you'd probably only want to use it two or three times at most to really make certain pieces of information pop. Or you can also bold the main uh, text in the discussion, which would allow you to bold more key terms Whereas the accent color would only be for like a few. If you bold main ones, you could use like five to seven bolded to bring information out that way as well. Good question. <clears throat> we have lots of good questions. Are there any additional at this time? Hopefully this has helped um, you in preparing your posters. Um, we do have another question from Dominic. As he states, under the testing section, I realized you used black color. Is this a very good idea? Uh, let's see. Black. Could you elaborate on what you mean by black color, please? Um, he states you just scrolled past it, so. Oh. Uh -huh. Perhaps on an earlier slide? Because the earlier was on some of the earlier. He said 78. Ah, 78. Perfect. Did you use? And with, with, can you, on 78, the black color in the testing, uh, ah, that was, oh, the black, the, the, when I had the conductivity graph, yes, that one also is one reason why I removed that image is because it didn't have very, it didn't have any information that really communicated anything, it was just a conductivity measurement. And it also acts a bit like a, um, a black hole that your eyes get swallowed into. So having something that is overwhelming black or white is probably not a good idea to have on the poster because that just draws too much attention to itself. All right, and we have another question from Ali. Um, would you include figure numbers or headings? And how would you deal with inserting equations? Also, how do you deal with acronyms? Uh, putting them in footnotes. Okay, so in this case, figure numbers and headings are not necessary for posters because usually the information that you are communicating based on the alignment relates directly to the figure right next to it. There isn't much um, extraneous information that would not relate directly to the graph. And figure numbers can, can take up room in the visual presentation. When I deal with inserting equations, there are different ways you can deal with that. You can create um, equations in like Word or LaTeX and then create and then export those as image files, which you can then insert into the post into the PowerPoint or the poster. And I usually find in creating it in a in a text editor and exporting it or screen grabbing it as an image file is the best way to go because trying to do complicated equations within PowerPoint is not very effective. And then how do you deal with acronyms? Put them in footnotes. Oh, so usually if you can, you want to avoid using acronyms on posters if you can. If you have the room, try to spell out the whole, say the whole word. But if it is uh, common, what you can do is um, spell out the words the whole time the first time, and then in parentheses after it, 
have what the acronym is, and then use that acronym throughout the rest of the poster. Good question. All right, do we have any additional questions? Thank you everyone again for attending. Um, please do go ahead and include your question if you have any additional. Um, otherwise, we will look to, oh, here we have another one from Dominic. Uh, what is the maximum number of columns you suggest the poster be split into? That's a good question. I would say probably three would be the maximum that you would want. Sometimes, Depending on the visual layout, you don't even need specific columns, especially if you rely more on the visuals and the information, of course, depending on the type of information you want to convey. But usually the, the three columns are the ones that I set up. We have uh, introduction, sample making, and uh, testing in one place. The results, since that's usually the main uh, conclusions that you want to communicate, take up the center, and then you'd have like the discussion and the references in the last part. All right. Um, we have a question from Pete. Um, he states, I have heard of a challenge that you should limit your word count to the same number you used in the abstract submission. So if you have 100 word abstract, you have 100 words on the poster. What are your thoughts on this? I've heard that one too, and I think it's a very good way to start. Like I suggested with the, the, the elevator speech where you have to try to communicate everything in three minutes, if you try to fit all of your information into only 100 words, that can be a really good way to force you to think of the main thing. However, for a full poster, 100 words, depending on your topic, can be a bit limiting. But usually, you can still get a, your poster in under 300 words, which is a bit more of a realistic uh, standard to aim for. And that's, of course, not all, uh, including like references and stuff, which can um, just be there at the end. My poster did end up having a bit more because what I ended up doing is for this demonstration, I modified my poster from one that I used during undergrad. If I were to go back and redo my poster, I could definitely find ways to cut down on even more of the words. Thank you, Pete. All right, we do still have some time for some more questions if you have them. All right, if we don't have any more questions, we will look on uh, going and wrapping it up. Um, again, the um, recording will be available online after the presentation. It uh, looks like we do have one more question from Dominic. Uh, he states, uh, could you add all of these Q&A alongside the slides when you're sending them uh, by email? Um, the questions are very helpful. Um, I will see, I'm not sure if the questions are captured, but if I can capture them, I will certainly go ahead and send them along. Thank you for, for asking. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for attending. Um, if you do have any additional questions after we uh, conclude the webinar, uh, please do reach out to me, um, Yolanda Natividad. That's ynatividad at ceramics.org. Um, I will be sending everyone um, the um, handout that Lisa mentioned um, during her presentation. So I will go ahead and communicate that with you all after the webinar. And I will uh, be able to direct you to where the webinar um, recording will be posted as well. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Good evening.